Okay, let's start. I'm recording it also on the video. Or you want to give more one more minute or two more minutes to people to join? It's up to you. Yeah, just two more minutes. Okay. So you're going to introduce the topic or? I am going to introduce you and introduce the topic. Okay. One more minute, Dr. Alvaro, we'll start. Okay, I think I have to start. Um, dear colleagues, thank you for joining. And uh, I will record for those who uh, didn't join, they will join later. So it's really my pleasure and my honor to introduce our speaker today. Um, he is my previous senior, my previous mentor, and uh, I uh, learned from him a lot. He's Dr. Ruben Alvaro. Uh, consultant neonatologist, assistant professor of neonatology, and the medical director of NICU at South Boniface Hospitals. Lots of research, lots of conferences sharing, um, especially interest in ventilation and apnea. Um, I can speak, keep speaking about him a lot. Um, he will be speaking to us uh, about high frequency ventilation. I've listened to his presentation many times, and each time I listen, I learn more new things. So, Dr. Alvaro, thank you for joining us, and it's uh, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you, Yahya. Um, it's a pleasure for me uh, to be here and try to share some of uh, the knowledge that I have acquired over the last uh, several years on high-frequency ventilation. Um, so let me share my screen and see, let me know if you have problems seeing it. You should be able to see the screen now. Can you see it well? Uh, looks, yes, yes, very well. Thank you very okay. much, go ahead. Perfect. Okay, so the, the title of my presentation today is, is High Frequency Ventilation, uh, why we need to use high frequency, when and how, how we, uh, we use it. So I have no conflict uh, of interest to, uh, to declare. So the objectives for today's uh, talk is to first describe the main differences between conventional mechanical ventilation and high frequency ventilation. We are gonna discuss the indications for high frequency ventilation. We are describe the mechanisms that affect oxygenation and ventilation in high frequency ventilation. And finally, we are gonna talk about the main differences between the two most common forms of high frequency ventilation, which are the high frequency oscillatory ventilator and the high frequency jet uh, ventilator. So um, you know that uh, the, the use of prenatal steroids, uh, the the use of postnatal surfactant and, and the new uh, and more sophisticated um, ventilators 
uh, and our better knowledge of how to ventilate our newborn infants have contributed significantly to the improved uh, survival of these infants over the last 20, 25 years. Nowadays, uh, most infants can be well and safely ventilated with conventional mechanical ventilation using the newest generation of ventilators that use uh, volume guarantee, using physiologic uh, tidal volume that can be actually be measured quite accurately. However, there are uh, a group of term infants uh, with severe lung disease, either from a conjugal aspiration or pneumonia, or that have uh, significant PPHN, or even uh, tiny infants that uh, have severe Hallam Bember disease can, that cannot be ventilated uh, with conventional mechanical ventilation, or they can be ventilated with conventional ventilators, but they need to pay uh, a big price in terms of uh, lung damage and lung injury. So these are the infants with moderate to severe lung disease that can benefit the most from high frequency uh, ventilation. Now, nowadays, so the benefits of high frequency ventilation is really only demonstrated uh, in lungs with moderate to severe uh, disease. So uh, if in general we talk about how we should ventilate uh, infants, uh, usually apply the, uh, the apply love, L-O-V-E, loss of ventilatory efficiency. First, you need to develop an a strategic specific uh, strategy for a specific pathophysiology. So not all the respiratory diseases can be ventilated equally. Second, pick the ventilator that can deliver the specific strategy for that pathophysiology that you're dealing with. So not all the ventilators are the same and can be used in any respiratory conditions. Third, change the ventilator strategy as the pathophysiology changes. So respiratory conditions are not static. Uh, they change with time. And, and many times these conditions can change very, very fast, even sometimes in minutes or in hours, especially when you have a baby with HMD that you give surfactant and, and, and the lungs can change quite dramatically over a short period of time. And finally, as soon as you intubate a baby, always works towards an appropriate extubation. The intubation is not the default. The default is extubation. So uh, we should always be working through uh, a, a way to minimize exposure to mechanical ventilation, weaning, and extubation. Now, having said all that, uh, there are some basic principles that apply to almost every single uh, pathophysiology and applies also to almost all type of ventilators, okay? So, and these are the general rules. First is try to achieve uniform lung inflation. So regardless of the lung pathology, regardless of the ventilator you're using, always try to achieve uniform lung inflation. Second, minimize over and under inflation. Over ventilation or under ventilation are always, always wrong. Third, try to minimize FiO2. Of all the things that we can do uh, to our lungs, uh, one of the worst thing is increase oxygen especially in newborn babies, since they don't have significant antioxidant um, defenses. So uh, always try to minimize the FiO2 by adjusting your ventilators to try to bring that FiO2 down. And fourth, always use early appropriate extubation. As I said before, intubation is never the default, never be happy with a baby that is intubated. Uh, always, always work toward extubating the baby, getting the tube, the tube out. So uh, there are three uh, important uh, parameters on lung physiology that determine how well the lungs are expanding. And these are the, what we call the critical uh, opening pressure, the critical maximal pressure, and the critical closing pressure in avoiding uh, lung injury. The uh, opening pressure refers to the pressure needed to open up uh, the lungs during inspiration. Uh, which is the pressure at which uh, air starts entering the lungs. The maximal pressure refers to the pressure over which uh, 
the lungs compliance decreases because of overstretching. And the last one, the closing pressure is one that is needed to prevent lung collapse on expiration or uh, the recruitment. So we know that uh, the least traumatic ventilation occurs in the mid portion of the pressure volume curve. So this is a graph that will show you uh, those uh, three pressures. Uh, on inspiration, we have the uh, opening critical pressure in which you can see the compliance becomes uh, uh, steeper. On the top here, we have the critical maximal pressure in which the compliance again uh, gets flat again, gets worse. You need more pressure to get less volume. And during expiration, you can see you have the closing pressure in which you tend to lose a lung volume when that pressure uh, drops to a certain point. So really what you wanna see in this uh, pressure volume curve, a curve is, is a smooth uh, line on inspiration, a smooth line on expiration without seeing significant changes in compliance, either on the inspiratory or the expiratory limb. So as you can see here, this is the area of uh, over distension, also called the beaking. So anytime you have you are ventilating above that critical maximal pressure, you are seeing over distension. Okay, and every time you are ventilating below that critical closing pressure, you are losing volume and you are developing atelectasis with uh, the recruit. So the idea is to avoid all these orange areas of over distension and atelectasis and just ventilate in this small safe window to prevent uh, lung damage. Now you can say, well, that's easy. Uh, all we need to know is to uh, need to find out what these three pressures are and try to stay within those three pressure and we, everything will be fine. Well, there are several problems with that. First is that not every single area of the lungs have the same opening, maximal and closing pressure. Second, it's extremely difficult, if not impossible, to measure those three pressures in the, in the clinical uh, uh, setting. And third, uh, it's, uh, it's something that relates to this graphic that I'm gonna show you here. Here we have the comparison of uh, lung volume in mLs per kilo in adults, term infants, and preterm infants. You can see here the red is FRC. The uh, dash red and white is tidal volume. And anything above these errors or below these errors is injury zones. So in adults, you have about 60 mLs per kilo that you can ventilate this line safely. However, if you do the same study in, uh, in term infant, you will find now that the, the space or the difference between the top and the bottom injury zone, it's only maybe 25, 30 mLs per kilo. So it's much more difficult to avoid uh, getting the, into those injury zones in term infant. But when you look at the preterm infants, look at that. You only have five or 10 mLs per kilo uh, to work with. So it's extremely difficult, if not impossible, to try to maintain uh, ventilation and lung volume with this, this very, very narrow uh, range uh, in preterm infant. That's why uh, it's, it's very difficult to, to avoid lung injury when you're using conventional uh, tidal breath like we do with conventional ventilator. So uh, during conventional ventilation, uh, there are swings between the zones of injury from inspiration to expiration, as you can see here in the inspiratory limb of this uh, pressure volume curve. So in, during conventional ventilation, the tidal volume usually goes above and below the, uh, the safe window. During high frequency ventilation, the idea is the entire cycle operates in the safe window and avoids the injury zones. Why? Because you're using very, very tida, tiny tidal volumes. that are sometimes the same or less than dead space. You're really not over distending the alveolis at all. And you're really ventilating the infants on the expiratory limb of this curve in this tiny, tiny area of uh, safe window. So uh, general principles about high frequency uh, ventilation. Uh, we know that high frequency ventilation limits lung damage by minimizing large 
uh, pressure volume swings. We know also that high frequency ventilation, uh, different than, than conventional ventilation, decouples ventilation and oxygenation. And this is mostly seen in uh, high frequency oscillatory ventilation, which is almost 100% decoupled. Uh, during the jet ventilation, as I'm going to explain later, there is mostly decoupled too, but not as a hundred, it's not a hundred percent. So the oxygenation in high frequency ventilation is controlled mostly by mineral pressure uh, or PEEP in the case of the jet. And ventilation is mostly controlled by frequency and delta pressure. Actually, it's, it's relatively easy when you understand the principles of high frequency ventilation to uh, ventilate babies on high frequency. There are very few knobs, there are very few uh, parameters that you need to, that need to change, that you need to learn how to, how to modify. So I would say that uh, using conventional ventilation, especially if you don't have volume guarantee, is more difficult than ventilating babies with uh, high frequency, okay? There are two type of, uh, two main types of high frequency ventilation. Uh, one is the high frequency oscillatory ventilation, which is much more common than the second one, which is the high frequency jet ventilation. High frequency jet ventilation is mostly used in North America. Uh, it's mostly used in Canada. Um, uh, we were fortunate to be one of the first uh, few centers in, uh, in the world that uh, use high frequency jet ventilation here in Winnipeg in the uh, early 90s. So we have acquired a lot of experience. And of course I have my bias in favor of the jet. I have used both. I have used the oscillator and the jet. And uh, I truly think that in my experience, at least when you get to know those ventilators well, uh, the jet uh, has an advantage. But of course, also depends on what type of lung disease you're dealing with. Okay. But I think in general, the jet ventilator is a more physiologic ventilator than the, than the oscillator. So uh, the other important difference uh, between conventional mechanical ventilation and high frequency ventilation is the way the pressure is transmitted to the alveoli. Here we have uh, an example of uh, uh, high frequency oscillatory ventilation in, in green on the left and conventional ventilation in red uh, on the right. At the proximal level of the airway, midway and at the alveolar level. As you can see during conventional ventilation, when you're using slow uh, rates, 60 breaths per minute or less, the pressure exerted by the ventilator propagates through the airway with little damping. So what you see in the proximal area in terms of uh, volume and pressure is what actually the alveoli is seeing uh, also. However, as uh, you start going up on the frequency, there is a lot of dampening, okay? And that's what's happened with high frequency uh, ventilation. As you can see here, the pressure and the swings that you see in the proximal airway are completely attenuated by the time you get to the alveoli. So when you look at the pressures and the parameters that you see on the ventilator and those numbers that show in the machine, those are not the numbers that actually the alveoli is seeing. That's only the numbers that in the tracheal tube or the, the trachea uh, is seeing. So don't be fooled by those pressures because sometimes those pressures could be higher than the pressure that you are used to see in the, uh, in the conventional ventilator. But again, those are not the numbers, those are not the pressure that the alveola, alveoli is, is seeing. So with high frequency ventilation, ventilation, there is attenuation of the pressures as air moves toward the alveolar uh, level. So here's another example of how those uh, pressure and volumes are transmitted from the proximal airway to the distal airway on conventional mechanical ventilation in the top, high frequency oscillatory ventilation in the middle and high frequency jet ventilation on the bottom. Okay, in the proximal airway, when you look at the mineral pressure, uh, there is no change in mineral pressure that's uh, seen uh, con with conventional ventilation in the proximal airways compared to the dis distal airway. So there is no loss of mineral pressure when you look at a uh, conventional ventilator between the trachea and the alveoli. When you look at the high frequency oscillatory ventilation, if you look at the mineral pressure, we are not talking about oscillations now, you're talking about just the mineral pressure, the way the lungs are expanded, there is no difference between the proximal airway and the distal airway. So you don't lose pressure, you don't lose 
minimal pressure as you move from the trachea to the alveoli during high frequency oscillatory ventilation. So that pressure is very stable. However, on the jet, which is very unique, you tend to lose mean air pressure as you go and you move down into alveoli. I'm gonna explain why that is. Okay, so this is the mean air pressure. When you look at the tidal breath, almost 100% of the tidal breath is transmitted from the proximal airway to the distal airway during conventional ventilation. So the volume and the pressure that you have with each breath during conventional ventilation are fully transmitted to the alveoli in conventional ventilation. However, on high frequency oscillation, as we said before, these oscillations, positive and negative with the oscillator, will be fully, almost fully attenuated by the time those oscillations get to the alveoli. So the alveoli actually is moving just a little bit like this. It's not moving like this, like the conventional ventilator, but it's just uh, moving like this. Very, very tiny waves are transmitted uh, by the time the air goes into alveoli. Now, uh, and this is why I now explain why the mineral pressure is uh, attenuated in the jet. A, a difference with the oscillator, the oscillator, this oscillation do not alter mineral pressure because they cancel each other. You have positive oscillations and negative oscillations. They are the same size, so they cancel each other. So the mineral pressure doesn't change. However, on the jet ventilator, they are not negative pressure. All the oscillations are positive. Okay, so all these oscillations will actually add a little bit of pressure to the mineral pressure. And because these oscillations are fully attenuated and decrease by the time they get to alveoli, that's why the mineral pressure gets lower at the alveolar compared to the, the trachea. Because you don't only have the peep that is tending the alveoli, but you have these oscillations that are always, that's only positive on the jet, they're going up, but as they get to the alveoli, they get attenuated. So the pressures in the alveoli will be lower than the pressures at the trachea. I hope this is, uh, this is uh, uh, clear. So, um, so high frequency in a way, high frequency ventilation uh, keeps, keeps the, uh, the lungs open at a constant and less variable airway pressure uh, that prevents the lungs from uh, the inflate, deflate uh, cycle, which has been associated with uh, lung injury and alveoli damage. So uh, when to use high frequency ventilation? Now, this, is, this uh, area here uh, is not uh, written in stones. I'm gonna give you my own bias and my own experience here. Uh, you will find other people that uh, use different indications for high frequency uh, ventilation. So again, these are not written in stones. These are my own uh, indication from my own experience. Uh, first of all, every time you have a problem with oxygenation, when you're on conventional ventilation, you're intubated and you're having problem with oxygenation, uh, we're using a mineral pressure of more than 15 or a PEEP more than 10, and you're using an FiO2 of more than 60%, then you should consider high frequency ventilation. When you uh, using physiologic tidal volumes, but the pressure that those physiologic tidal volumes are, uh, are achieving and they are 26 or 30 or higher than that, you should also consider switching the baby from conventional to high frequency uh, ventilation. Every time you require a volume of more than five to six mLs per kilo to maintain normal CO2 levels, uh, you should also consider switching from conventional to um, oscillation, both to high frequency. Every time you have an air leak syndrome, you should also consider using high frequency ventilation. In extreme premature babies, uh, again, although this is controversial, I would say every time you have a, a extreme preemie with uh, more than mild uh, Harlan Bemmer disease, you should consider uh, switching to high frequency uh, ventilation. And finally, when you have a case uh, that uh, especially term infants with severe PPHN and the need of inhaled nitric oxide, you should also consider uh, using or switching to high frequency ventilation because you can achieve more uniform uh, lung expansion compared to the conventional ventilator. 
Now, as I said, these indications are not written in stones and uh, depends a lot on how comfortable or familiar uh, your NICU or your NICU personnel feels with different type of ventilators, okay? We know that most animal studies have given the high frequency ventilation an edge over conventional mechanical ventilation in terms of preventing lung injury. However, most clinical uh, studies, especially in, in uh, newborn babies, have shown controversial results. So uh, again, these are my bias in terms of what I use, what we use here in Winnipeg to switch a baby or to consider switching a baby from conventional to high frequency. But again, it depends a lot on how comfortable you are using high frequency. Because if you never have used high frequency ventilation, I would say just keep working on, on the conventional a bit longer, okay? Until you get familiar on how to use the high frequency and then you can start using uh, more conservative uh, parameters to switch a baby sooner, okay? So let's talk about the oscillator first, and then we're gonna talk about the jet. Uh, the most common, uh, one of the first uh, oscillators that were developed for use in newborn babies was the Sensomedics uh, 3100A. The 3100B is usually used in, in pediatrics. This is a big machine, a very bulky machine that was uh, uh, approved in 1991, at least here in North America, uh, for neonatal application for the treatment of all forms of respiratory failure. Uh, in 1995, uh, was approved for pediatric application with no upper uh, weight limit uh, for treating selected patients failing uh, conventional ventilation. So at the beginning, it was used mostly as a rescue. Okay. So what are the general principles that uh, the high-frequency uh, os oscillatory ventilation uh, works? So uh, it's basically a, a CPAP system with a piston that display, displays uh, gas, okay? So it, it's like um, a, a diaphragm that is electro electromagnetically driven, similar to the magnet that you see in a speaker, okay? So you have this machine that uh, will deliver uh, flow into the lungs at, up to uh, the mineral pressure that you set. So when the machine is, is reading that pressure that you set, it will close the valve and will keep that air inside the lungs. And then what it does, this, this uh, uh, magnetic or piston will move air in and out, in and out from uh, that mineral pressure. So above the mineral pressure and below the mineral pressure uh, to uh, develop those oscillations that will actually uh, provide the ventilation and remove the CO2. Again, those oscillations are uh, cancel each other because they're positive and negative. So in a way, what the oscillator is doing is pushing air into the lungs and sucking the same amount of air from the lungs, okay? So uh, has an active exhalation because it sucks the air uh, out of the lungs, uh, uses tidal volumes less than an atomic uh, death space, usually between one and three mLs per kilo. Uh, the rates uh, range that the oscillator uses is about 180 to 900 breaths per minute is measured in hertz. Uh, one hertz is equal to 60 breaths. Uh, in general, uses lower peak inspiratory pressures for a given mineral pressure are compared as compared to uh, conventional mechanical ventilation. And finally, one of the as I said, characteristic of the high frequency uh, oscillatory ventilation is uh, almost 100% decouple of oxygenation and ventilation. You can actually adjust the oxygenation and the ventilation completely separately. So the two most characteristic uh, principles of high frequency oscillation is active exhalation and almost 100% decouple of oxygenation and ventilation, okay? So uh, oxygenation uh, in high frequency oscillatory ventilation is basically uh, controlled by the mineral pressure that you actually set on the, on the machine. You have a knob that uh, you can modify and actually set the mineral pressure to the number you want and FiO2, okay? And we know there is a direct relationship between mineral pressure and FiO2 for oxygenation. You can oxygenate uh, within uh, certain limits. You can oxygenate babies using lower mineral pressure and high FiO2s, 
or you can obtain similar oxygenation by using high mineral pressure and lower FiO2, okay? So in general, it's we consider it's much more physiologic to use high mineral pressures and lower FiO2 because of the, the, the effect of high oxygen uh, in the lungs, the oxidative stress of oxygen in the lungs. For ventilation, there are basically two uh, parameters that you will modify. One is amplitude, which is the delta P, which is basically the distance in the oscillation, how, how big, how tall those oscillations are. Uh, what's the, the, the difference between the top and the bottom of those oscillations, okay? And the other one is frequency that is usually measured in Hertz, as I said, one Hertz equals 60 breath, okay? So uh, to control oxygenation, as I said, you primarily control the mean airway pressure and the FiO2. The mineral pressure, as we explained before, in the uh, os oscillator is constant pressure used to inflate the lungs and hold the alveoli open, okay? So on that mineral pressure, does not change. You don't lose mineral pressure as you reach the alveoli, as you do a little bit with the jet. Since the mineral pressure is constant, it reduces the injury that results from cycling the lungs open and closing on each breath. So it basically maintains the alveoli open, okay? A favoring uh, increased uh, surface area of the alveoli and uh, favoring ventilation perfusion match. Oxygenation strategies, uh, these are general principles that we use. When you switch a baby from conventional ventilator to the oscillator, you need to use a higher mineral pressure in general, okay? Uh, I'd always uh, tell the fellows and the, uh, and the, the students, that the residents, that is basically a, a price you need to pay to have a baby on the oscillator. Because the oscillator will suck air from the, the lungs. There's a much higher risk of air trapping, okay? So you really need to have the lungs slightly more open than normal to prevent uh, air trapping during expiration, okay? So uh, when you switch a baby from conventional to uh, the oscillator, you need to use slightly higher mineral pressure, about two to three centimeters of water. Second, uh, to determine what's the optimal and what's the ideal mineral pressure on the oscillator, uh, you need to be able to increase the mineral pressure by one slowly until you achieve optimal lung volume, okay? Now, the question is, how do you know when you are getting to the optimal lung volume, okay? And then for that, you look at basically a few parameters. One is you look at the change in uh, oxygenation and uh, that's seen by oxygen saturation and decrease in FiO2, okay? So as the lungs get properly open, you need to see that the FiO2 that you need to keep a normal saturation level or PO2 start going down, okay? Uh, second, if you do a chest X-ray, you need to see the lungs open at about T9 on, on chest X-ray without causing completely flattening of the diaphragm and without seeing a lot of uh, dome in the diaphragm. So it has to be uh, a, a mild uh, dome that you see on the diaphragm. And if you count the posterior ribs, you need to see about uh, nine ribs uh, as a lung expansion, okay? Usually we say that you need to keep working up on the mineral pressure until you get to an FiO2 that is 60% or less, okay? Of course, you need to rule out other causes of poor oxygenation because if you have a baby with PPHN and the reason for the oxygenation is not so much that the lung volume is not optimal, but you don't have significant pulmonary blood flow, then you're not going to achieve a lower FiO2. So this is assuming that you don't have significant PPHN, you don't have any other reason for uh, hypoxemia, uh, except for the fact that the lungs are not fully open, okay? So you should work on the uh, mineral pressure going up slowly by one until you see that FO2 dropping below 60%, okay? And always, always watch for over distension. Why, why I say that is because as you start going up on the mineral pressure, you are also changing the compliance curve, right? So when you achieve a, an optimal lung volume with let's say a mineral pressure of uh, 16 or 17, most likely that's not the mineral pressure that you're gonna need after that. That's the mineral pressure you need to open up the lungs and move the compliance curve to the left. But as you achieve the lung volume, most likely if you keep that pressure at the same, you're gonna cause over distension. 
So most of the time, as soon as you achieve that opening pressure, uh, whatever that is, and you have moved the compliance curve to the left, and you have brought the FR2 down, usually you need to come down by one or two. And again, monitor the FR2 to be sure that it's not going up again, and maybe do another x-ray to be sure that you don't lose uh, lung volume or that you are not, you are still not over distended, okay? Uh, if you see your, your heart uh, that is still very small and the diaphragms are flat and you have more than nine ribs, most likely you are over distending and you're going to pay a price because you could be well oxygenated, but now you're going to have decreased cardiac output, decreased venous return, and you're going to have other problems, okay? So it's not just oxygenation. Okay. How do you control ventilation on the oscillator? Uh, is usually how much that piston moves in and out, okay? So the, the distance between the, uh, the in and the out of the piston and how fast that piston is moving, which is the speed or the frequency, okay? Now, it's important to uh, compare what we consider the formula for alveolar ventilation during conventional ventilation that is usually defined as you know, frequency times tidal volume. In conventional, both frequency and tidal volume have basically the same effect, 50 and 50% on the minute ventilation, okay? So you can modify either one and you can almost achieve the same effect. However, in high frequency uh, ventilation, especially the oscillator, the formula for minute ventilation is frequency times VT square. That means that the, the change in volume has a significantly much more effect, a greater effect on minute ventilation than frequency. So you are not gonna change your minute ventilation much by changing the frequency, okay? In the high frequency, you need to change tidal volume to get a significant change in your mid ventilation. Okay, uh, the frequency that you're gonna use is mostly based on the type of pathophysiology you're dealing with, and it's more related to the time constant of that pathophysiology they're dealing with that you set the frequency at. Okay, so you don't set the frequency to change uh, mid ventilation. You set the frequency based on the pathophysiology you're dealing with the time constant to see if you can go faster or slower, okay? And you use tidal volume, which is the basically delta P, the difference between the, the peaks of the oscillators, the oscillations, to uh, change uh, tidal volume. So I'm gonna give you an example here of how that changes. So the stroke volume, which is basically uh, tidal volume in the high frequency oscillator, is if increase if the amplitude so the difference between the delta P, the, the oscillations, uh, increases. Okay, so every time you increase the delta P, you increase tidal volume, as you can see here in green. Also, every time you decrease the frequency, you get a longer cycle time. So the inspiratory time that is fixed uh, in relationship to the expiratory time gets significantly uh, longer, greater. So as you decrease the frequency, your inspiratory time gets wider, gets longer. So your tidal volume is gonna go up. So this is different than what you see uh, in the conventional ventilator and also the jet, as we're gonna explain later. In conventional ventilator, you decrease the frequency, your, your minute ventilation goes down. During high frequency oscillation, you decrease the frequency, your minute ventilation goes up because the tidal volume gets bigger, greater, and because tidal volume has much more influence on medium ventilation and frequency, the overall change in medium ventilation is going up. So it's the opposite direction when the, you lower the frequency, okay? So what ventilatory strategies you use for uh, uh, the oscillator? Uh, well, you used to use higher frequencies up to 10 Hertz for small babies uh, or less than 15 nanograms and disease with short time constant. So conditions that have uh, a short time constant, classical example is uh, Hallen Bember disease. Those are the condition that has decreased compliance and uh, normal airway resistance. You remember time constant is the product of compliance times airway resistance. So uh, in HMD, you have very low compliance. The airway resistance is low, it's not affected. So your time constant is gonna be very short. So you can go fast, okay? And the faster you go, the more attenuation you get in those swings towards the alveoli. So in tiny babies with HMD or any baby with homogeneous Lyme disease with short time constant, you can go fast, okay? However, 
if you have a baby that has mostly problem with airway resistant, uh, like meconia expression or various BPD, you need to slow down, okay? Because the time constant now is, is, is longer. So if you don't slow down, you're gonna have short time for expiration and you're gonna get a, a high risk for air dropping. So use lower frequencies, six to eight Hertz at the most for term infants and diseases with long time constant or conditions that, have, uh, that are heterogeneous, that are different uh, time constant and different parts of the lungs if you want to avoid air trapping in some areas, okay? Usually when you start, when you switch from conventional to the oscillator, you need to start with an amplitude that is usually two to 2.5 times the mineral pressure. So if your mineral pressure is, uh, is 10, uh, you can use an amplitude of 20, 25, okay? If your mineral pressure is 15, you can use uh, 30 to 40, 45 um, amplitude, okay? And you need to adjust the amplitude to see uh, the, the wiggle, uh, uh, the movement of this, the abdomen extending almost to the lower part of the abdomen, okay? To improve ventilation, always said before, first increase the amplitude. Don't play around with the frequency. Just leave the frequency alone and just play with the, the amplitude, okay? Now, usually we say that if you get to a point that you need to go more than three times the mineral pressure on your amplitude. Let's say, let's say your, uh, your mineral pressure is 10 and you're already on amplitude of 30. Uh, if you need to go higher than that because your CO2 is too high, then most likely you're gonna be at very high risk for developing air trapping, okay? So in those cases, you have two options. You can slow down, you can decrease the frequency. So you will get more tidal volume for the same amplitude. Or what you can do is, is, again, you could go up on your mineral pressure. Again, even if you don't need it for oxygenation, again, it's a, a, a price you have to pay to prevent air trapping, okay? In those cases, you can increase your mineral pressure by one or two, then you have more room to move in your, in your amplitude, okay? So that, those are usually the strategies that we use. Okay, let's go to the, the jet now. Uh, as I said, uh, to me, it's a, it's, it's a better machine in terms of... Uh, uh, adjusting to the pathophysiology uh, that you're dealing with. So the JET is a, is a unique vent high frequency ventilator that uh, works in tandem with the conventional ventilator. The JET ventilation doesn't have any valves like the, like the oscillator, okay? The only thing that JET can do is deliver a high speed flow through a small tube, okay? That's the only thing that the JET can do. So it can, doesn't have any valves to provide PEEP or mirror pressure. That's why you need to have the conventional ventilator to develop or to provide that PEEP uh, for you, okay? So usually you have the jet on the bottom and the conventional ventilator that could be any regular conventional ventilator uh, on the top, okay? So uh, as I said before, the jet works uh, develop, they are delivering very high velocity jet pulses through a small catheter. Uh, it has passive exhalation, so there is no sucking of the air out of the lungs. Again, similar to the oscillator, uses very tiny uh, volumes, less than atomic dead space. The rates are a bit slower than the oscillator and is measured in, in breath per minute, not in hertz. Go from usually 240 to about 660, although we never use frequency more than 400, 420. Uh, we never go lower than 240. Uh, the other th unique thing, different than the oscillator, is has variable inspiratory expiratory ratios. In the oscillator, the ratio is fixed, usually one to one or one to two. Uh, so every time you change the frequency, you change both, inspiration and expiration. In the jet, it's different. They are completely dissociated, okay? So every time you change the frequency, the only thing you change is the, the expiratory time, okay? Uh, there is a special knob to increase or decrease the duration of inspiratory uh, time, okay? So the ratio could be uh, quite variable. Uh, as I said before, it's used in tandem with conventional ventilation that usually is required to provide the PEEP. And the jet ventilator used primarily for ventilation and the conventional ventilation on top of it works for primarily for oxygenation and side breath by developing uh, the PEEP, okay? So this is the way that the, the jet works. We have the machine, it's a black box, and now it's gray, uh, that deliver a high speed, high flow um, through a small uh, catheter that goes through a, a whisper jet box that sits usually at the bedside. 
So as you can see, this uh, jet box here has like a, a small piston that will compress that catheter coming from the, uh, from the jet, uh, bringing the flow, okay, at the speed that you set, okay? So if you set 240, that piston will compress the catheter 240 times a minute. It's like a hose in your garden, okay? You have, you're running the water through a hose and you are compressing the, the hose in the middle. So at the end of the hose, you will see swings in the, in the pressure, right? The pressure is going to go up, up and down, up and down, up and down. So that's what the jet does. So deliver a very high flow, very high speed, and it will compress that small catheter in the whisper box, okay? And that will be transmitted to a special uh, endotracheal tube adapter that has three ports, okay? Different than the conventional endotracheal tube that you use. This one has three ports. One on the side here that brings the the flow, the high speed flow from the jet and the whisper box. Then it has another port uh, on the side that brings uh, this a catheter that is actually measuring the pressure here and send that information back to the whisper jet box as a servo control. So what it does is the machine is always trying to keep the pressure that you set on the jet and adjust how much this tube is, will be compressed according to the pressure that is reading uh, in the uh, in the proximal part of the endotracheal tube, okay? And then you have, of course, the conventional ventilation on top that will have the normal connection to the endotracheal tube on the on the bottom, bringing the flow and uh, providing the, the peak, okay? So this is the, the whisper uh, jet box that uh, compresses that small catheter in the middle at the, and the pressure and the, uh, and the speed that you, you set on the ventilator, okay? So sits on the bed near the patient, measures pressures and send data to the jet and always for servo control of pressure required to meet PIP. So this machine will receive the, uh, the information of the pressure in the tracheal tube and it will tell the, the, the jet, okay, the pressure now, uh, let's say you have the, your PIP set at 20 and it's actually measuring 30 now. So the machine is telling, well, the pressure is too high. You need to, you need to decrease your power, okay? Uh, on the contrary, if the pressure that is set instead of being 20 is only 10, the machine will say, the, the whisper ball will send the information to a jet. It's saying you need to increase your power because you're not achieving the pressure, okay? So and there's a button in the, in the jet that is called the servo pressure that basically reflects how much power the jet is delivering. So looking at that number, you can tell basically how good the compliance of the lungs are. So when the compliance of the lungs goes down, let's say you have a collapse or you have secretions, you will see that the cell pressure goes down because the pressure is achieved very fast, okay? On the contrary, if you give surfactant and the compliance gets better, then the machine is gonna have, have trouble reaching those pressures. So it's gonna have to increase the, 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 the pressure delivered by the jet and the cell pressure is gonna start going up. So you can actually follow the trend of that servo pressure to know if the lungs are getting worse or they're getting better, okay? And, and, and correlates very well with, with CO2 and mini ventilation because if you know uh, what you need in terms of power from the machine, let's say you, you have a servo pressure of three, um, and all of a sudden the servo pressure change to five, well, you know that your CO2 is gonna be very low because the compliance has changed, has improved. On the contrary, if you have a servo pressure is three and now goes down to one, and you stop the wiggling, most likely you lost lung volume, your compliance has gone down, and you're not ventilating, and your CO2 is most likely going to go up. So you can follow very uh, closely that cerebral pressure to let you know where you are in terms of ventilation. Okay, so uh, the jet has on the top has the measure value values. So these are the, the, the values that actually the machine is measuring at the endotracheal tube. This is uh, and, and here on the bottom, we have the set values. So you set the set values you want, and these are the set values you measure. And here you have the servo pressure. This is the number that I just talked to you that is indicator basically of a lung compliance. So you can actually follow that number quite closely to know if ventilation is going up or down. Again, the absolute value is not that important because it depends not only the compliance, but depends on the size of the tracheal tube, the size of the baby. There are many factors that actually um, will change that number, but it's important to, to, to follow that number as a trend, okay? Especially over hours. Okay, so uh, in the high frequency jet, uh, you measure delta P, which is the difference between the PIP and the PEEP, which is reflection of tidal volume. The servo pressure, as I mentioned before, is the flow or the power required to deliver the said PIP. 
It's a reflection of the lung and chest wall compliance. And you have the PEEP delivered by the conventional ventilator that measure is measured close to the patient, different than the, the, the way that the PEEP is measured and conventional is measured at the machine. Okay. And uh, it should actually be lower than the set PEEP. Okay. If the jet PEEP is greater than this, the, if the jet PEEP that the, the, the measure, the PEEP that the jet is measured is greater than the PEEP that you set on the conventionally. So watch out because you may be dealing with gas trapping. Okay, so the, the PEEP that the jet is measuring and the trachial tube should always be the same or lower than the PEEP that you have set on the conventional ventilator. Okay, how do you control oxygenation on a high frequency jet? Very simple. You control by mineral pressure that is mostly controlled by the PEEP on the conventional ventilator. So just, just increase the PEEP uh, similar to the way you increase the mineral pressure on the, on the oscillator. Okay. The difference with the oscillator is the mineral pressure is not set on the jet, it's calculated, okay? So you can't set the mineral pressure, okay? So if you wanna match the mineral pressure when you switch from conventional to the jet, you need to usually use a peep, try to match the mineral pressure that the machine is gonna read, okay? And, and adjust the peep, try to get to that mineral pressure that the, the jet is gonna, is gonna calculate, okay? Although conventional side breath and high frequency jet ventilation PIP also add to the mineral pressure. Remember these oscillations are always positive. So they are going to add a little bit to the mineral pressure on top of the, of, of top of the, P, of top of the P. However, lung volume is mostly maintained by P. Okay. So if you have problem with lung volume, you don't play around with the PIP. You don't use side breath. You just use the PIP. Okay. So you adjust the PIP uh, up or down to adjust your lung volume. Uh, Again, because the PEEP on the jet is closer to the bitter pressure than the PEEP on the conventional, then when you switch a baby from the conventional to the jet, you need to use a slightly higher PEEP on the, uh, on the jet to match the same inner pressure that you were using on the conventional ventilator. Usually it's one or two centimeter water higher than the PEEP that you are using on the conventional to obtain the same mineral pressure. As I said before, uh, the mineral pressure usually is lower than the high frequency oscillatory ventilation should be very similar to the mineral pressure that you needed in the conventional, okay? And uh, the side breath provided by the conventional ventilator helps sometimes to maintain and recruit lung volume. Remember that the jet doesn't have valves. So every time you lose lung volume, the fastest way to recruit the lungs uh, is by giving side breath, okay? So just regular conventional side breath. Okay, so the question is to cite or not to cite on the jet ventilation. The advantages of using side breath is you can recruit collapsed lungs units very fast. Uh, you can prevent the recruitment. The disadvantage of, of using side breath is again, same as the conventional ventilator, you are risk for value trauma and you're actually minimizing the benefits of high frequency jet ventilation when you're using side breath. Okay, so how do you control ventilation on the jet? Very easy. You control by delta P. The delta P is the difference between the PIP that you set and the PEEP that you have. Okay. Uh, you can also use the frequency, but again, remember that the, the formula on the jet is similar to the oscillator. It's VT squared times frequency for total volume. So changing the frequency is not going to give you a lot of changes in your ambient ventilation. If you want to change, if you want to improve ambient ventilation, you have to increase your uh, tidal volume. The way you do that is by increasing your PIP. So the difference between the PIP and the PIP. If you get into trouble and you get to a point where we cannot increase the PIP anymore because the maximal PIP on the jet is 50 and you're still having problems with oxygenation, you can actually increase the tidal volume by increasing the inspiratory time. Okay, The inspiratory time on the jet is set to 0 0.02 seconds can actually increase that by 0 0.024, 0 0.026, up to 0 0.03, 0 0.34, okay? Uh, and you're not gonna lose a lot of expiratory time because the, 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 the amount of time you increase your inspiratory time is minimal. So you still have a lot of time for expiration and the risk of trapping is not significantly greater. So uh, same as the oscillator, you use lower frequencies when you have uh, heterogeneous lung disease, which long time constant and you use higher frequencies when you have babies uh, that have homogeneous lung disease with very short uh, time constant, okay? 
So as I said, frequency has little effect on PCO2. You use faster rate, shorter TI in small premise with homogeneous Lyme disease. And you use lower rate with longer TI, uh, expiratory times in larger infants with heterogeneous Lyme disease like meconium aspiration or, or BPD or pneumonia, okay? And also you use uh, uh, shorter, uh, sorry, uh, slower respiratory rates when you have Ehrlich syndrome like PIE, okay? Because you have a very high risk of trapping with PIE. So you have to slow down. So usually you should bring the rate down all the way down to 240. And every time you have pulmonary hyperinflation or air trapping, you have to slow down. You have to bring your frequency down so you have more time for expiration, okay? So adjust the Delta P to obtain desired PCO2 levels. And as I said, the TI you can use to increase the tidal volume if uh, increasing PIP is not enough to maintain CO2 levels, okay? So the main difference between the two, I'm gonna summarize that to finish. Uh, in the oscillator, uh, again, there is no size limitation uh, the jet is limited to small children. Uh, the oscillator has a constant mineral pressure, a fixed inspiratory expiratory ratio, and an active expiration. The jet has a short uh, inspiratory time, a variable inspiratory expiratory uh, ratio, and a passive expiration. So it has a significantly less risk for air trapping compared to the oscillator. Okay? The oscillator is ideal for homogeneous lung disease like RDS or acute lung injury. Uh, it's also ideal for uh, inhaled nitric oxide in conditions with PPHN. And uh, the main issue with the oscillator is a very high risk for trapping because you're using active exhalation. You're sucking the air out of the lungs. So you have a very high risk of compressing the airway be before removing the air. The jet is ideal for non-homogeneous lung disease like meconium aspiration, chronic lung disease, and pneumonia. And it's also ideal for Ehrlich syndrome. If I were to summarize, I would say the oscillator in general is better for oxygenation. The jet is much better for ventilation, okay? So the oscillator on the top, the jet on the bottom, uh, the oscillator doesn't need a conventional ventilator to work, the jet does. The rate in the oscillator is six to 10 Hertz. Uh, translated that into a jet, it's only four to seven. So the jet usually is, uh, uses lower rate. The inspiratory time, it is much longer on the oscillator, go from 0.1 second to 0.02 seconds. On the jet, usually it's just 0.02 seconds uh, default. Uh, you can actually go to 0.03, but uh, no, no much more than that. The IE ratio is usually one to two to one to one on the oscillator, but because uh, it's not fixed in the jet, you can go from one to three to 111, 112, depends of the rate you're using. If you're going down to rate of 240, your ratio is only is almost one to 12. So 12 times the expiratory time compared to the inspiration. The exhalation, as I said, in the oscillator is active and on the jet is, is passive. So in summary, the type of ventilator and ventilatory strategy should be based on the severity and pathophysiology of lung disease, as well as patient, si patient size. Change the strategy as the disease uh, changes. The goals of assisted ventilation should be to achieve lung uh, uniform lung inflation to minimize over and under inflation to minimize FiO2 and to always aim for early and appropriate extubation. Early optimization of lung volume in the atelectatic prone lung is proving to be lung protective. By delivering very small tidal volume, high frequency ventilators allows to ventilate the lungs in the mid portion of the pressure volume curve, avoiding the injury zones. The oscillator is the ventilator of choice in homogeneous severe lung disease. The jet is the ventilator of choice in non-homogeneous severe lung disease, as well as in Ehrlich syndromes. Because of the active and short expiratory time, the oscillator is prone to air trapping. Because of the passive and long expiratory time, the jet is ideal for air trapping syndrome. And I think that's the end. Thank you so much. I'm open for questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Alvaro. Um, I am very much ad, um, like it, um, amazing. I can listen to it for days. And there are a couple of questions for you. Um, so the first question from Dr. Nazar, uh, under what mechanism does the air goes in and out of the lung during high frequency through the uh, same tiny tube? Okay, uh, during the jet, 
the uh, the expiratory is passive, so it's just the last thing recorded. The internal barrel is asking about high frequency oscillator, not the jet. O oscillator, yeah. Okay. So the, the the oscillator basically is is uh, when the that piston, that magnetic piston moves in above the inner pressure, is pushing the air uh, inside the lungs, creating a positive pressure above the inner pressure. On exhalation, that piston moves out, so it sucks the air out of the lungs to get to a negative pressure below the mineral pressure. Okay, it's like you have a balloon and you're pushing air out and you're sucking air out uh, with your mouth uh, in a negative way. So that's why, because of the uh, the active exhalation, the the sucking of the air out, if you don't have enough lung volume, if you don't have enough uh, mineral pressure, or your expiratory time is too short, okay, and you're sucking that air out very fast, you're at risk of collapsing the airway, small airways, before you actually remove there from the lungs. So it's an active exhalation, different than the jet that is passive. Okay, so thank you very much. So a question also about high frequency ventilation. Um, the question is, um, if I understand it very well, is, um, is the high frequency ventilation is the preferred mean of supporting for neonate with respiratory failure? I don't know if he means that it's above, you know, diff, you know uh, preferred than conventional or preferred than other way of, of ventilation. Well, as I said, um, it depends. Uh, I, I can't give you a straight answer. Uh, depends of the degree of uh, lung disease you're dealing with. Uh, depends on the pathophysiology that you're dealing with. Um, and depends also how comfortable you are with using the high frequency ventilation. If you're a unit that are not used to use high frequency ventilation, don't go there. Just keep working on the conventional, okay? Uh, because you need, as with any, any new technology, any new machine, you need to learn. Uh, you need to get used to uh, working with that machine to work it properly. So uh, as I said in general, uh, for mild conditions like HMD, I think conventional ventilation, if you have, especially if you have a, a volume guarantee, can work very well. I never, personally, I never use a high frequency uh, as a prophylactic mode. I always, always, 100%, uh, no matter how small the baby is, I always, if a baby needs intubation, I always start with conventional ventilator, okay? And only I switch to high frequency if I have trouble maintaining oxygenation because I need to use very high mineral pressures or PEEP, or I have problem with ventilation using high tidal volume, or I'm getting very high PIP pressures on the conventional in a tiny baby, then I switch to uh, high frequency. So I can give you a straight answer. Again, depends of your unit, how used you are, the type of high frequency ventilation you have, oscillator, oscillator versus jet, and how severe the lung disease uh, that you're dealing with. So the other question is, is there is a good technique for monitoring the lung volume at the bedside uh, to prevent high, high frequency ventilation providing over distension and gas trapping? Yeah, that's a, that's a good, unfortunately, that's a probably the oscillator. Uh, now the new oscillators uh, have uh, a vol um, volume guarantee uh, 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 parameters that you can actually set the volume that you want and the oscillator will actually adjust the the delta p to deliver that volume that you set okay so that's very useful because you you don't have those big oscillations in co2 because the machine always will del be delivering the volume that you set the problem with that is that the machine will keep increasing delta p until you get that total volume that you set. And if you're not careful, if you go very high with your amplitude, you could get into air trapping, okay? Now, there is no way to know in the oscillator if you're getting air trapping unless you monitor uh, cardiac output, blood pressure, uh, chest X-ray, and so on, okay? So uh, that's why, as I said, you have to be careful with the oscillator, okay? Um, and that's why I personally don't like the oscillator because I've seen too many, uh, many mistakes. Uh, people achieve a good oxygenation with uh, going up on the mirror pressure. They forgot to bring it down. The next morning you come in 
and the baby's being oliguric, acidotic, uh, hypotensive, you do an x-ray and the heart is this small, the dots are flat, the lungs are expanded 10, 11 reps. So the baby's been hyperinflated all night uh, and because the oxygenation is good, so nobody paying attention, everybody was happy, okay? And you do a, a blood gas and the CO2 is 80, 90 because you have a trap in and increase that space. So with those ciliary, you have to be careful. With a jet, because it's a passive expression and the risk of a trapping is, is less and you can follow that servo pressure that gives you a very good idea how, how, how good your lungs are, uh, you can get a better monitoring. That, that's why I like the jet better. Okay, thank you very much. Now, Turhadi is also asking you the same question. I think you answered how to monitor a baby on high frequency oscillatory ventilation. A that question from- Yes, X-ray, cardiac output. Yeah. So uh, Dr. Ahmed is asking you, is there is a way to predict the opening and closing pressure in conventional ventilation? Uh, well, yes. Actually, the, uh, most of the new ventilators have uh, pulmonary graphics that you can use. Uh, you can actually look at the volume, uh, volume uh, pressure curve, and you can see if actually you see a smooth transition inspiration or expiration. Uh, you can look at the compliance. Okay, uh, it will give you a number. You can look at the, uh, the C20 over 20 compliance. They will tell you if there is over distension, uh, if that number is, is low. So there are a lot of things that you can have in the conventional ventilation that will help you to define if you are uh, over -ventilator, ventilating or under ventilating. Okay, it depends on the compliance curve. If it's, if it's flat, if it's uh, uh, steep, if you have a, a significant flat portion on the top and then goes up like that, meaning that you need higher peep. Yeah, there are, there are ways to know for sure in the conventional by looking at the pulmonary graphics, yes. Okay, uh, Dr. Manal asking you how and to what uh, uh, win the high frequency ventilation to conventional ventilation or to SIPA, like right away? Sorry, can you repeat that? So how to win conventional uh, high frequency ventilation and to what? To mechanical ventilation oh, or okay. to SIPA? Yeah, good point. Uh, actually, uh, again, it depends how comfortable you are with the high frequency. Uh, in general, we, we could extubate straight from the high frequency jet to the to CPAP, uh, to we can extubate straight from jet. We don't have to go down to conventional. Uh, the only problem with doing that, when you're on the jet, you can't be 100% sure how regular the spontaneous breathing are. So uh, it's hard to know, okay? Because the, 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 the jet is, is gig move, moving all the time, a very fast rate. So it's hard to know how much spontaneous breathing you are getting, if it's consistent or not. So sometimes you need to switch to conventional just to see if the baby can maintain uh, normal, regular, uh, spontaneous breathing before you take the tube out, okay? Uh, but definitely you can extubate straight from, from the jet or the oscillator to the uh, to nasal CPAP. There's no, there's no problem. We, we Have, do you that all the time. Have you done Sorry? it yourself? Have you done it yourself? Oh, yeah. Have yeah, we have extubated, especially the tiny babies that you don't really want to expose those babies to uh, conventional mechanical breath. Uh, and again, it doesn't, you, what you can do is you can do even a, a 10, 15 minute or half an hour PSV trial in which you go from the jet to uh, PSV VG mode, just to, with a very low rate, backup rate, to see the baby's breathing on top of the, it's breathing 30 or 40 at least, so in half an hour. If the way you switch and the way is not breathing, well, you know he's not ready to be extubated. Oh, okay. uh, but yeah, you, we, we have extubated babies straight from jet, yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Dr. Arima is asking you, uh, what about hybrid conventional ventilator? Are they effective? Say again? Hybrid, hybrid, hybrid. I don't know what she means, but hybrid. I never worked with them. Hybrid? Yeah. Hybrid? Yeah. Conventional ventilators? Yeah. Yeah, but the, the high, hybrid conventional ventilators are basically the volume guarantee. So they're called hybrid because they are pressure ventilators, but they, are used, they measure volume to adjust the pressure that is delivered. So that's why they're called hybrid. And that's what we use now. Uh, most of the, uh, all, all the conventional ventilators are used in North America, I would say they're hybrid uh, because you can measure volume guarantee. So you can actually, they're pressure ventilators, so they only can deliver pressure, but they will adjust the pressure according to the mm -hmm. volume that they're measuring 
at the, at the, in the transducer and they're adjusting the next breath PIP to achieve that expiratory volume. That's why they're they hybrid because these are pressure ventilators. They use volume to control that pressure. And that's what we use. Yeah, they're all hybrid, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Dr. Ma Lizel uh, uh, asking you, please kindly explain again the relation of manipulation of hertz for ventilation using high frequency ventilation. Okay, so the, the frequency that you use for high frequency, again, depends on the pathophysiology of the land or the land disease you're dealing with, okay? So when you have a condition that is homogeneous, means that both lungs are equally affected top to bottom. Classical example is Hallen Bember disease, baby that is born, has let's say a white out um, uh, x-ray from severe surfactant deficiency. Uh, those babies have a very short time constant because remember time constant is compliance times airway resistant. Base with HMD has a very low compliance and a normal airway resistant, okay? So the resistance is low, the compliance is low, so the product of those two will give you a very short times constant. So it's very easy, very fast to reach the alveoli and very fast to get rid of the air from the lungs. So those babies can be ventilated very, very fast. You can go with a very high frequency. In, in oscillator, you can go up to 10 hertz, 12 hertz. Uh, in the jet, you can go to 400, 420 breaths per minute. You are not going to get a trapping because, again, the time it takes for the lungs to get into alveoli and the time it takes for that air to remove from the lungs is very short. However, if you're dealing with a condition that the main issue is airway, increased airway resistance, like meconium aspiration, okay, uh, or bronchopulmonary dysplasia, then the time constant now is gonna be longer. So you need longer time to reach the alveoli and longer time to get rid of air from the lungs. So you can go very fast because your mm -hmm. if your expiratory time is too short, you're gonna get a trapping. You're not gonna be able to remove all that air. So in those conditions, meconium aspiration, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, you need to use lower rates. You need to slow down. On the oscillator, you go down to six, seven, eight at the highest, okay? To get more time for expiration. On the jet, again, you go down to 240 breath per minute. So you get a longer expiratory time, okay? I don't know if okay. that answered your question. Yeah, I think very clear. Um, so uh, Dr. Hadi asking you any place for nasal high frequency ventilation? I think he mean uh, uh, non-invasive. Actually, uh, that's a, a relatively hot topic nowadays. We just published a study that we did in our unit using uh, high frequency oscillatory ventilator uh, through the nose um, to prevent reintubation. Uh, the, nobody has done a proper RCT yet using large number of uh, babies. Our was a pilot study using about, I think we used 33 babies. And we found that about two thirds of the babies or 70% of the babies uh, responded well. And uh, these were very sick babies that were almost ready to be reintubated. And we prevented reintubation in 70% of them. Uh, I think it works better uh, when you are able to transmit those oscillation into the alveoli. And for that, you have to have a proper interface and you have to have proper transmission of those oscillations from the nose to the alveoli to provide some kind of uh, ventilation, okay? Uh, so it doesn't work all the time. Uh, we still need to find out what's, what's the best interface to use. We still need to find out what the best uh, uh, settings are for uh, nasal high frequency. But most of the study have shown that in a lot of babies, when you can get the right interface, you can actually provide some uh, ventilation through the nose with high frequency that may prevent some babies from being reintubated. I wouldn't use as a primary mode when you have significant lung disease because the transmission of those oscillations is not very good. Okay, so it's only helping when you have a baby that is almost ready to be uh, reintubated. Uh, you are failing nasal CPAP and you want to try something else before intubating. Then definitely you can try uh, high frequency nasal oscillation. And again, in, in, in about two thirds of the babies, you can prevent and can keep the baby extubated. Okay, great. So um, I don't know if that's a question or a criticism, but uh, Dr. Imad is asking you, as you said from the beginning, you are biased toward high frequency jet ventilation. Yeah, 
Well, as I said, I'm biased because I use both and I have experience with both. Uh, I'm not saying that it's, 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 it's better. It's, again, it depends on the, uh, how familiar you are. Uh, depends also the type of pathophysiology you're dealing with. If you're dealing with a, a condition that is, is HMD and uh, is homogeneous Lyme disease, I think the oscillator can work very well, uh, even maybe better than the jet. Uh, but in most other conditions in which you have problem with ventilation and you have problem with the trapping, I think the jet is safer at least uh, because you have the servo pressure uh, and it's a passive exhalation than the oscillator. Now, if you are very good using the oscillator and you know how to prevent uh, air trapping and you know how to prevent uh, lung hyperinflation, yeah, I have nothing against the oscillator. And I would say most of the studies in the clinical setting have, have been done with the oscillator. So I, I wouldn't say it's, it's better. I would, so I would say it's maybe safer. And, uh, and when you get used to both, uh, again, my impression, we have both, both ventilators in the unit and we use 99% of the time we use a jet uh, and nobody's paying us to use a jet. It's that when you get familiar with both, you realize that well, the jet is, is maybe, it will give me more uh, back from my, my, my money. Uh, I did a, a, a Cochrane review with Chelsea and Peter, Peter Davis from Australia and uh, basically you find no difference because there is no randomized control trial yeah. comparing yeah. both. No, yeah. the, you won't find any study showing that the jet is better or the oscillator is better. Uh, as I said, it's, it's preference. Uh, when you know how to work with both, you, you can decide for yourself. Uh, so uh, I, I would say the, the jet is more physiologic because it has a passive expression and you have much better control of the inspiratory time than the oscillator. Uh, but again, the, the oscillator, if you know how to, to uh, work with it, it can be very useful. Okay. okay. Uh, Dr. Fanton is asking you, are you tired or you can take more questions? That's okay, yeah, I'm okay. Yeah, so Dr. Fanton is asking you, what is maximum MAP allowed to in tiny babies with uh, you know, severe prematurity? Okay, there's no maximal MAP that doesn't, doesn't exist. Why? Because if your lungs are very, 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 very stiff, uh, no, you can use very, very high pressure. And uh, if the lungs are like a rock, you, use the, use high, very high, you need to open the lungs. If you're not gonna open the lungs, uh, the baby's gonna die from hypoxemia. So of course, the higher the mere pressure you use, the higher the risk for lung injury, but you need to open the lungs, whatever it takes, 20, 25, 30, it doesn't matter. I've seen babies, so especially chronic babies with, um, that come back with RSV pneumonia uh, with very stiff lungs. Uh, that requires mineral pressure that are very high, 25, 30, 35. So again, you, you need to open the lungs. Uh, you can't say, oh, I can't go more than 20. Well, if you don't go more than 20 or whatever number you pick and, and you are not opening the lungs with that pressure, the baby's gonna die from hypoxemia. So uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's, if you're dealing with a very stiff lungs, uh, sometimes you have, there's no limit for the mineral pressure, whatever it takes to open up those lungs. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Imad is telling you that uh, he's using the high frequency oscillatory ventilation by Fabian ventilator with a volume guarantee and they have excellent results. Yeah, no, definitely the new, the new uh, oscillators with volume guarantee uh, it will give you much more control. You don't have to keep adjusting the delta P all the time to uh, to deliver the volume you set. Uh, it definitely, it's it's like volume guarantee. Uh, you're gonna get less CO2 uh, variation, less CO2 oscillations uh, mm -hmm. when you have volume guarantee. But again, the, the only problem with volume guarantee on the oscillators, you have to be careful because the machine will keep increasing the amplitude until you get that, uh, total volume. And if you go very high on your amplitude, usually more than three, three and a half times your mirror pressure, the risk of a trapping goes exponentially higher. So you need to be aware of that. Okay. Don't assume that is you set the volume and you can go back to sleep. Okay. So uh, you need to be sure that the, the amp you can actually measure how much amplitude the, the machine is using to deliver the volume that you set. Okay. So mm -hmm. if the amplitude that the machine is using is less than three times the mineral pressure, you're safe. But all of a sudden, if you see that the amplitude the machine is using is much higher than three times the mineral pressure, watch out, because that baby is a very high risk for a trapping. 
Okay, so the question is, is how to wean and then, or how to escalate and how to wean high frequency or serial ventilation with, uh, with volume guarantee or other question, how the volume guarantee is measured in high frequency ventilation? Okay, so the way, the way see, it, when you have volume guarantee on high frequency oscillator, it's easy because you don't have to actually wean the, uh, the, the amplitude. You set the volume and the, the amplitude will win by itself. Okay, it's like the, uh, the tidal volume conventional ventilation, the PIP will be win by itself. As the compliance get better, you will need less pressure to deliver that uh, tidal volume. In the uh, high frequency oscillator, it's the same thing. As the compliance of those, those lines get better, the machine will need a, a, a smaller amplitude to deliver the volume that you set, okay? So you can follow that amplitude and see how that amplitude is going down, okay? And as the app is going down, meaning that the compliance of the lungs is getting better. And if the compliance of the lungs is getting better, you will see also that you will need less mineral pressure to uh, keep the lungs open, okay? So uh, I would say that in high frequency to determine when is that baby ready to be extubated or wean back to minimal conventional ventilator, you have to look at the mineral pressure on oxygenation, okay? Because you need to know how much pressure you, you need to keep the lungs open, okay? Because if your mineral pressure is still very high, and you, you think, well, can I extubate this baby? Well, can you actually duplicate that mineral pressure using nasal CPAP, okay? So uh, sometimes you can, sometimes you cannot. So if your mineral pressure is, is, is 15, well, you're basically need, gonna have to have a, a PEEP of at least 15 or close to 15 through the nose. So can you actually achieve that, okay? So most likely not. So you have to wait until the mineral pressure is, is lower. But in, in terms of ventilation, again, you look at the amplitude and see how the amplitude is, is coming down as you maintain the same uh, volume and, uh, and go from there. Yeah, that, that's the way. It, it definitely is easier than changing the amplitude all the time when you don't have volume guarantee. Dr. Dan is asking you, um, is the flow interrupter works better for high frequency oscillatory ventilation in VN500? Um, I would say, I don't think anybody has done a, a true comparison between the VN500 and the sensor medics. Um, the main difference is the VN500 has a limit uh, size in terms of the, how big the baby could be, although the new generation of VN500 can use bigger babies. Uh, I personally think that physiologically the sensor medics uh, it's, it's generally get better uh, ventilation than the flow interaction, the VN500. Uh, again, we don't use the VN500 much for oscillation, uh, but definitely it's a good option if you, um, you have one ventilator that can do both and you don't wanna start switching or bringing a new machine into the unit. Uh, I would say it's a, it's, if you have a small baby, you can definitely try the VN500. And if you know how to use it, most of the time it will be fine. So the, the differences are very minimal, yeah. So, but again, nobody has done a study to show uh, which one is better. So, but I think the sensor medic is, is more a true oscillator than the VN500. Okay, thank you very much. Dr. Alvaro, I have a question for you, but it's outside the, uh, your talk, if you allow me. Um, do you intubate all babies below 27 weeks and do not give them a trial of CPAP regardless their performance? No, <laughs> I, I we never routinely intubate anybody anymore. Uh, the first thing we do with these babies is, uh, again, uh, delay crow clamping, if you can, at least one minute. Uh, as soon as the baby is, is brought to the recess, we put the baby on CPAP right away. And actually, if you can provide CPAP uh, by mask or, or by nose, uh, while you're doing the electro clamping, that's even better. Uh, so, and usually I personally, unless the baby comes out very flat and in very bad shape, uh, I usually very patient with these babies. And he, I wait three to, at least three to five minutes for them to develop the FRC just using nasal CPAP. And, uh, and establish their own FRC before I decide to go in with the tube, okay? So, and, and 
if if you can maintain the baby stable with nasacipab without intubation, what we are doing right now, uh, we're using the, the mist of the LISA technique for giving surfactant that uh, Yaya introduced to us when he came uh, to Winnipeg. Uh, that's what we're trying to use now in almost every single baby. Um, so we are trying to prevent intubation. We are trying to prevent positive pressure ventilation by using an angiograph and, uh, and delivering surfactant that way. Uh, no, so okay. we don't intubate babies prophylactically anymore. So you don't give prophylactic uh, surfactant? Well, we do by list or mist. Yeah. It, so I, I tell baby, you, we had a baby uh, three days ago, a 25 weeker that was born 700 grams. Uh, it, took, it took us about five minutes to, to get the baby stable just with Nessa Cipap. We had to use a higher uh, peep at the beginning for the first few breaths up to 10, 11. And then we, we brought the peep down right away as, as the baby started breathing. And uh, he was requiring 50% oxygen on Nessa Cipap of seven or eight. And uh, so we decided to give bless, but we did it by Lisa. Okay. Uh, Dr. Ahmed is asking you uh, uh, what about using laryngeal mask airway and high frequency ventilation? So I can't hear you that well. It was cut off. What about using laryngeal mask airway with high frequency ventilation? We don't have any experience with that. We have no experience whatsoever. I don't know if you can do that. Maybe, maybe somebody can do a study or somebody has done a study, but we don't, we don't have uh, any experience with that, sorry. Oh, okay. And Dr. Rula is asking you, using uh, of sensor medics as ventilator need to keep them alignment with the baby, which, uh, which sometimes is difficult. How can this technically be managed? I, don't, I didn't understand the, the question, Rula. Yeah, me neither. Use, use of sensor medics as ventilator need to keep them Yes, alive. hi, good evening. Yeah, good evening, doctor. Hi. Hi, thank you, Dr. Rubin. Uh, my question is when we used to use sensor medic in my previous uh, hospital, uh, we have to keep the alignment of the connection between the machine and the baby, which sometimes is really difficult for keeping the, the, the hangar for the tubes to be kept at the same alignment for the sensor medics to uh, transmit properly the high frequency. Technically, we, we found difficulties in that. This is like technical uh, issue. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's true. And with that, that's a problem with high frequency. That position of the trigger tube, position of the, uh, the, the tubing, yes. the head is very finicky, okay? As soon as you have any, any decrease in, uh, in airway diameter, anywhere from the ventilator to the, uh, the endotracheal tube or the airway, you're gonna lose all those oscillations. And if you lose the oscillation and you lose the wiggling, you are not ventilating, okay? You can have the lungs open all you want with your mineral pressure, but if you're not transmitting those oscillations, you're not gonna remove CO2. So uh, you can have a baby that is not changing, but all of a sudden you have small kink or a small uh, change in the endotracheal tube position and all of a sudden you have no oscillation going to the alveoli and the CO2 can go from 40 to 150 within seconds because you're basically stopping ventilation. So yeah, that's the problem with oscillation and it requires a lot of nursing time and another nurse expertise. Uh, in general, it's better to keep, as you said, the tube in the midline with the head in midline just to be sure that you are transmitting those oscillation properly. And if you're gonna change the position of the head, which you can, you don't have to keep the head in, in the mid, mid position all the time. You need to be sure that you reassess the amplitude, the transmission of the wiggling and, and, and the CO2, okay? Because things can change quite dramatic when you just change the position of the head or the tube, okay? So, and ideally you wanna keep the, 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 the bevel of the neutral tube anteriorly. You don't wanna have it on the side or posteriorly. You wanna have it above, uh, on, on, the, on the top anterior, okay? So usually there's a blue line going into the endotracheal tube that tells you where the, the position of the bevel. So you wanna keep that, that blue line facing uh, upwards, okay? But, but uh, Dr. Elvaro, this is true for all the ventilators, not only yeah. for sensitive minutes. Well, uh, not so much for the conventional, because the conventional, the problem with conventional, yeah, no, the, the, of course, frequency. you have a kink in the endotracheal tube frequency. or uh, nothing is going to be admitted. But the conventional, because it's much easier to transmit all that tidal breath into the alveoli, 
they need a much more uh, a greater kink or a greater obstruction on the tracheal tube. In the oscillator on the jet, you just need a small kink or a small change in the position of the tube to stop all the transmission. So it's more finicky, it's, it's, it's more fine than the conventional. Yeah, no, no, but uh, the position of ETT is the same for all. Oh, yeah, no, the position of the tube is usually the same. Not specifically. For the, yeah. yeah, but everything is maximized when you use high frequency. Yeah, so that's yeah. why you need to be more careful with that frequency than the conventional. The conventional is, is more, it's give, it, it has more uh, it significantly more changes. Yeah. 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 Well, I think that's the end. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. I, um, I didn't see you in two years now. Thank you very much for coming and giving us the talk. Uh, I really appreciate it. I know it's in a, now it's a, very cold over there. Um, it is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I miss that, of course, but uh, I, mean, I don't think you do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank okay. you very much. Nice. I really appreciate and nice I appreciate everybody. Thank you very the much for the, your uh, your attendance. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you very thank much. You I really appreciate it. Bye bye. Thank you bye. very much, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your thank night. You. Thank you very much. Thank you.